As we move into the new year, uh, we are going to be talking about God's plan. God's plan for us as a church, for us as individuals, uh, for, for us as His children. And um, it's something that uh, the church council has been working on for months. As a matter of fact, just about all of last year, uh, about uh, where does God want us and what does God have planned for us moving forward. And uh, over the next few months that we're going to begin uh, sharing with the church and the church council is going to continue to focus and, and refine uh, this process to be able to come to Woodland and say, this is what God wants of us. This is where God wants us. This is what he wants us doing. But um, there are just some absolutes that God absolutely wants from all of us, especially his children. And our scripture this morning, 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16, uh, I'm using the New uh, American Standard Bible today. Uh, it uh, translates it, uh, I think, uh, most accurately for us and succinctly for us. Uh, so follow along as I read uh, the scripture in uh, 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Now that's the ultimate plan. That's the ultimate purpose. God calls us to be holy. Because He's holy. He calls us to be like Him. Now, before I get too far ahead of myself, we're actually going to just break this set of verses down. Uh, and we're going to start uh, right up toward the top where it says, Prepare your minds for action. This phrase in the Greek literally says, Gird up your loins and get going on the journey. Now, if you remember back in the day of Jesus, everybody wore dresses. Even the guys. Okay? Okay. Uh, guys called them robes, uh, but they're a little hard to run in, okay? Uh, ladies, y'all remember the denim skirts from, boy, we'll go back to the 70s again, okay? I mean, those things were pretty tight, and it was tough to run. Uh, so imagine a guy in a dress trying to run in Jesus' time, or in the time of the disciples, well, what they had to do is they had to gird up their loins, which meant that they pulled up their dresses, okay, and they took their sash, and they basically ran their sash through their legs and around their waist, making a belt, and they turned their dresses into running shorts so that they could run. And any time you had to get somewhere fast, that's what you did. It was very common to gird up your loins and get on the way. So that's the phrase here that Peter, uh, that Peter uses, uh, but metaphorically, what he's speaking of to us, okay, is to prepare our minds, to gird up our minds for the journey of the kingdom, to get prepared for, for the journey up here and in here, not just in our physical activity. So he says, prepare your minds as one would gird up their loins for a race or a journey. And then he said, be sober or keep sober. Again, literally, that meant to be free from intoxicants. That meant to not be drunk. But as he used it here metaphorically, he was indicating us to be watchful and prepared. As we prepare our minds to move forward into the kingdom, 
be watchful along the way. So prepare your minds. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Fixing your hope. When the our instrumentalists are up here, whether they're playing the flute or the guitar, or we really can't do it with the piano, but um, we have to have somebody come in and tune it. But you'll see a guitarist, so they'll you know, strum their guitar and they'll listen, and then they'll start fiddling with those little keys up top, whatever they are, and then they'll strum again and they'll listen. Basically, they're tuning their, their guitar, uh, or a flautist or a clarinetist will adjust it. Uh, just about all instruments are tunable so that you get it right. Well, Peter is saying, focus your faith. Get it tuned in. Focus your faith completely or perfectly on Jesus. From whence growth, I mean grace, flows. Focus yourself on Him. As you are preparing and being watchful along the journey, as you are moving forward in the kingdom's work, stay focused on your faith as obedient children. And we we'll want to remember, Peter was a Jewish man. He understood the Jewish scriptures. Obedient children is an Old Testament reference to children of faith or the children of Israel. So he was drawing back on the history of a lot of the people that he was communicating with in a, in a symbolic phrase that they would be familiar with. Obedient children. An allusion to God's children or Israel. Goes on further in the verse to do not be conformed to your former lusts as when you were disobedient children, as when you weren't believers, as when you were far from God, as when you were, were unwilling to fix your faith on Him. You know, everybody believes something, even atheists believe something. They happen to believe that there is no God. It takes as much faith to be an atheist as it does to be a believer. But an atheist is a disobedient child. Sadly, there's a lot of believers that are disobedient children as well. But he's saying, don't do it the old way anymore. We spent an entire six weeks uh, working through Ephesians 4, the unregenerated self or the old self, and putting on the new self back in the fall. This is, this is the, the imagery that, that he's talking about here. Do not be conformed to your old self anymore. If you're going to be fixing your faith, if you're going to be focusing on the kingdom, if you are preparing yourself or girding up your loins for the kingdom journey, then you can't get distracted by the old stuff. You can't get distracted by the things that you used to take pleasure in. You can't get distracted by the things that used to trip you up. You've got to get away from them and become obedient children. And then he begins to use a phraseology of holiness. And he says, but like the Holy One, be holy yourselves. And that takes a little bit of unpacking. The other stuff is pretty straightforward. Okay? And yes, lifesavers work well. To remember to be holy. But what does that really mean to us today? I mean, we could very simply say, well, be like God. Hmm, okay. Then I'm going to become invisible and indivisible. I'm going to be able to go from here to there in, a, in an instant. Nobody will see me. Is God a superhero? Captain America, Spider-Man, Superman, Batman, depending on if you're Marvel or DC. I don't know. There's a big, apparently, schism between the two fan bases. 
Okay? Apparently Batman and Spider-Man can't be in the same movie. Just doesn't work. They're under separate contracts. Okay? We can't just all of a sudden be like God. We can't be God. So we've got to unpack this holy thing. What does that mean to us who aren't God but followers of God to be holy? I don't think Peter's in error when he's challenges us, challenging us to be holy. He's referencing back to Leviticus 11.44 where God says, You shall be holy for I am holy. He's speaking to His children, speaking to Israel. He's speaking to the people that He has chosen. He's saying, Don't be like the world. Be like Me. You're Mine. Be like Me. Doesn't every parent want their child to sort of grow up like them? A lot of children emulate their parents, want to be like their parents. God's plan for us is to be holy. So let's unpack holy for a minute. Let's look at the Hebrew and the Greek. They're fairly similar. In the Hebrew, holy means pure. Means devoted, dedicated, separated, sanctified. When things were holy... In the Old Testament, they were things that were set aside, purified, sanctified, most often for use within the temple. That's how people understood it. Priests and Levites were set aside, sanctified, purified to serve in the temple and temple rites. So the imagery for, for an Israelite was understandable. Holiness is purity. In some ways, holiness is perfection. Holiness is different than everything else around us. If you remember Zechariah, John, uh, John the Baptist's father, uh, as uh, Elizabeth had become pregnant and everybody was having dreams and visions about children and names and everything else. And, and um, he had been chosen by Lot to serve in, uh, in the sanctuary and to make offering uh, because it was his time not only for his clan to be serving, but then he was chosen from the clan to serve uh, in the temple proper. He had a vision or a visitation about calling his child John. His father had been set aside. John the Baptist was set aside. The, the right of the Nazarenes or the Nazarites in the Old Testament for a period of time you were purified and set aside for, for a purpose for God. So, so holy in Jewish thought was understandable. In Greek, it wasn't too far off, but there was this concept of cleansing oneself from defilement. Some of you are familiar with the Essenes, a, a, a sect of, of Judaism that uh, left uh, the Israel and went out to the desert. They're responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and, and a lot of holy writings. Uh, they were particularly connected to ceremonial cleansing. Washing, washing the body, washing the hands, washing the feet. In an attempt to be holy. They didn't want to be defiled by, by the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees or the Sadducees who were not, according to them, living holy lives. They didn't want to be defiled by, by the community, by the larger groups, by the city, by, by the world. So they left and they moved to the desert to be cleansed from defilement. If we can only get away from all the worldliness, we can maybe be a little more holy. So in Greek, there's the understanding of cleansing oneself from defilement or living a holy life or living sanctified. So as we unpack this holiness, as, as Peter, referencing back to Leviticus 11.44, be holy, for I am holy. 
is call, calling his readers to a life of holiness, to a life of purity, to a life of, of devotedness, to a life of dedication, to a life of separation. What do you want, Pastor? You want us all just to pack up and move out to the desert? Donna's aunt, uh, we were talking about this this weekend with the kids. Uh, I think back in the 60s, uh, somebody came through Chicago and was selling property in Nevada. And all of her little Bible, uh, Bible uh, group friends all bought an acre in the middle of the desert in Nevada. All right, Still undeveloped. It's still out in the middle of the desert. But we were talking to the kids, and the kids said, well, let's go build a house on our property. Because Joe gave it to Donna. Uh, and, and it is. We did Google Earth and everything, and, and we came down on it. And there's, I don't know, 1820 sagebrush on it. You know, probably a couple jackrabbits and coyotes. But nobody lives out there. I, I, I think this guy sort of swindled all these ladies in Bible study. All right, uh, But they all bought an acre, and they're all next to each other, and none of them are developed. They're in the middle of the desert, and, and Hannah was saying, let's just move to the desert. We'll live off the grid, Dad. It'll be great. I could handle that. I don't think she could take two days. Donna couldn't take two hours. You know, but it sort, of, it sort of harkens back to this, just get out of town. Just, just move away. Just, just get away from all this stuff. You know, but as we get away from stuff, we just make idols of new stuff in the emptiness. We don't need cell phones or televisions or newspapers or, or running water. We'll create idols out of nothing. Because that's who we are. And Peter's call was to fight against that. Not run away from the world. But in the midst of the world. Fight against the worldliness and live a holy devoted life. And he drew back on the law that God gave Moses back in Leviticus. Where God said, be holy. For I am holy. Holy. That's absolutely God's plan. And that's absolutely God's purpose. We cannot get away from that. That is that grand plan that we ended the year with last week. And we pick up this week. We cannot get away from the fact that God has called us to be His children. And as His children, He calls us to be like Him. No way around it in the muck and the mire of what this world gives us, and the difficulty and the pain and the sorrow that it causes, and all the distractions it has for us, in the midst of it all, God is not telling us to run away and create a desert community. God is calling us in the midst of the world to live differently. And every person in here today is capable of doing that. Through grace that comes from God. I've, I've um, retranslated verse 15. Let me read verse 15 again uh, from the NASB. It says, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all of your behavior. I, I've retranslated it or, or paraphrased it in a way that made a lot of sense to me. And I hope it does to you too. Listen to verse 15 in, in my version as I read it. Live a holy, cleansed life, being sanctified by God, to be like God, pure holiness. In the midst of that verse is our job and God's job. God has a promise to us to sanctify us, which is, which is continually growing more like God every day as we live our life of faith. 
there is this, remember, there is this instant of salvation and this lifetime of sanctification. But it's all God's work. It's God working in us and on us and through us to make us more like Him. So God's work is sanctifying. Our work is living a holy, cleansed life. Have any of you ever been sprayed by a skunk before? Smell doesn't go away right away. Can't just throw your clothes in the washing machine because everything for the next month that you wash in that washing machine will smell like skunk. Now they've got all sorts of tricks, you know, tomato juice and, and all of that stuff, but uh, I can go out and play in the mud and I can come in, I can take a bath and I can wash the mud off. But if I get sprayed by a skunk, that's going to stay a while. Now, today's modern technology and cleansing agents, they've probably got something now that can get it off really fast. But back in the day, those old 70s, okay, your mom would scrub you with a lava bar. Anybody remember lava bars? Which basically took the first two or three layers of your skin off. All right. But it did a pretty good job of cleansing. But if you got sprayed by a skunk, clothes went in the garbage. And you washed and you washed and you washed and you washed, hoping to get that smell off. You know what? The world just permeates, reeks of sinfulness. And we are in the midst of it every day. And we go home smelling like it. Our job, through the study of God's Word, through prayer, through discipleship, through accountability, through living together in the community of God, is to cleanse ourselves from the stink of the world and to let God do His sanctifying work in us. Be holy. Pure, devoted, dedicated, separated, sanctified, cleansing oneself from defilement, living a holy life, living a sanctified life. For I am holy, says the Lord God. So, so that's our big umbrella as we move forward into 2018. Living a holy life, fully devoted to God been our motto for the last two years moving into our third year of living a devoted life as a step toward holiness my prayer is that you're willing to allow God to work through you and in you and that you're willing to do your part in living a holy life if you are willing, and I am willing, and we are willing, the world out there will see in us the kingdom of God. And there will be stinky smelling, skunky people that will be drawn to us. But we will show them how to be cleansed. We will teach them about the sanctifying power of God. We will watch their lives be transformed. And one person at a time will win the world for Christ. Amen.